everyone. Welcome. Yes. Welcome to our broadcast for today. I'm so glad you joined us. Thank you so much for being here. Please, please, please stay where you are. And uh, the word of God for today is going to challenge you. That's what it's all about. It's taken from the writings of Paul the Apostle in his letter to the Thessalonian Christians. In chapter 5 of the first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians, Paul gave a long list of admonitions. One of those admonitions is what we're going to be considering today. Please get ready uh, to be blessed. But I don't want you blessed alone. I want others blessed with you too. I know you have friends. I know you have loved ones that you can call, that you can text, and you can send the link to the uh, platform that you are on, whether you are listening or you are watching. Because I really believe that everyone deserves to be blessed by the word of God for today. But before we do that, I like to make my usual announcements. The first, yeah, Bishop Itiola's podcast. You can access the podcast by downloading my podcast app on the Google Play Store for those of you who use the Android phone. Or you can listen directly on the Spreaker app, which can be downloaded for both the Android and the Apple phones. But do you also realize this, that virtually all podcast providers carry our prayers and carry our sermons from Amazon to the big guy, the Apple podcast, Spotify, Amazon, mention them. We are on all of them by the grace of God. And you can choose which one you want, and you can be blessed as you join us. You'll be listening to prayers this Thursday and this Friday, and you'll be joining people from over 50 countries around the world that have downloaded over 129,000 episodes. Please check us out. It will be worth your while. Well, we're also on Facebook. I got to tell you that. Many of you know that already. We're on Twitter. We're on TV also. Did I say Twitter? Well, you know their new name. We're on RBS TV 13 in Guyana. Every Saturday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. That will be local time. And we're also in 23 Caribbean island countries through Mercy and Truth TV in Jamaica. Every Saturday from 2.30 to 3.30 local time. Did I tell you that we're in Guyana on RBS TV 13? I hope I did. Well, every Wednesday also in the mornings at 1.30 a.m. we're on Mercy and Truth TV in Jamaica. And if you're in any Caribbean island country, you can join us there also. I pray for the station in Guyana, the station in Jamaica, that the Lord will bless the owners and the employees also. And of course, we pray for all the 23 great countries and also the country of Guyana. May God bless your government. and May God give you peace and abundance. Don't forget to listen to us on our own radio station. Yes, Fresh Waves Radio. It is on 24-7. And on that station, you can listen to a variety of programming that's been a blessing to many. And I'm pretty sure it will be a blessing to you also. Fresh Waves Radio. You can download the app for both the Android and the Apple phones from their respective app stores. Just type Fresh Waves Radio, install the app, and you are good to go. Please help us spread the word. Don't forget, as I said earlier, this Thursday and this Friday at 7 p.m. I will be on the podcast. 
I will also be on all the uh, platforms that we are on presently. Uh, that will be 7 p.m. this Thursday and this Friday for a great prayer meeting that has been a blessing to many people, hundreds of people. I will not say thousands. We have not got to thousands yet, but one day we'll get there and we will pass there. It's a beautiful time praying together. You know what they say? A trial will convince you. Please join us this Thursday and Friday. You will be more than convinced that this is great experience praying at the throne of mercy. Well, those are all my announcements. Let's go and announce our presence to God that we need his help. Even as we share the bread of life together, Father, bless us as we share the bread. I pray that this table that we are sitting around will be a table that will change our lives forever. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Everybody said amen and amen and amen. Paul in the book of First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 22, he gives us a list, a list of powerful admonitions. Let me read some of them to you. First Thessalonians 5, 16, all the way down. Rejoice evermore. We can preach a whole sermon on that. Pray without ceasing. We can preach many sermons on that. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 19, quench not the spirit. Verse 20, despise not prophesize, verse 21, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Verse 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. And then the last is verse 25, brethren, pray for us. There's no way we'll be able to look at all these admonitions within the time that we have allotted to us today. So the admonition we're going to extract from those verses is the one in verse 22. What does this say? Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's an admonition that is worthy of a thorough study by all heaven-bound citizens. And if you're looking for a title for this sermon, I think that says it all. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Two thoughts are noticeable upon reading that verse. One is obvious. The other is implied. The obvious thought is that we are to abstain from every appearance of evil. The second though, is that if we are to abstain from its mere appearance, then we are to abstain from evil itself. So we should abstain from what looks like sin. We should abstain from what leads to sin. And we should abstain from what borders upon sin. Someone put it this way. He who is not shy of the appearances of sin, he who shuns not the occasions of sin, and who avoids not the temptations and approaches of sin, will not abstain from the actual commission of sin. Don't you just love that? I feel like repeating it. He who is not shy of the appearances of sin, 
who shuns not the occasions of sin, who avoids not the temptations and approaches of sin, will not abstain from the actual commission of sin. Our focus today is not on the second, but on the first, abstinence from not only evil itself, but that which seems to be wrong. Abstain from it. There are many things which are known to be wrong. They are positively forbidden by the laws of heaven. And the world agrees in the sentiment that they are wicked, all right? But there are also many things about which there may be some reasonable doubt. Now, there are many things which in themselves may not appear to be positively wrong, but which are so considered by large and respectable portions of our community. And for us to do those things will be regarded as inconsistent and will be regarded as improper. Nothing is wrong, for example, nothing is wrong in buying lemonade from a package store. Nothing. You didn't go there to buy alcohol. You didn't go there to buy spirits. You went there to buy lemonade. But that store says package store. So coming out of the store <laughs> with a brown paper in your hand can call your action to question. That's what we mean by appearance of evil. You've done no evil. But what you've done appears to be evil. Another example. Nothing is sinful in asking his sister to meet you at the park for prayer. But someone seeing both of you sitting on the park bench is going to stumble. Abstain. Not just from sin alone, but from whatever appears to be sinful. I'll give you another example. Nothing is wrong in a lady having night vigil alone with a brother in her house. But someone seeing you coming out of the house at 6 a.m. in the morning. Aha! You got what I mean? You didn't go there to sin. You went there to pray. But coming out at 6 a.m. in the morning, two or three people in your church, they see you. You violated, abstain from every appearance of evil. Listen to me, good people. Some things may not be sinful in themselves, but may carry the appearance of sin. Can I repeat that? Some things may not be sinful in themselves, but may carry the appearance of sin. You know what we do? What you do with such things? Abstain from them, avoid them. You know it's an old Chinese proverb that says, "Do not stop in a cucumber field to tie your shoe." The meaning is very simple and very plain. Someone will be likely to think that you are still in cucumber, so move away from the cucumber. Uh, farm and then tie your shoe. The safe and proper rule of life is to always lean to the side of virtue. The Jews have a saying that is very agreeable to this. This is what the Jews say. Remove thyself afar off from filthiness and from everything that looks like it. That's good. The old naturalist tells us that a dove is so afraid of a hawk that she will be frightened at the sight 
of one of its feathers. You got the picture. The sentiment that I just expressed, all of them are taught all through the scriptures. So I'm going to take you on a journey through the word of God, and you'll be able to see that God calls you and I not to just abstain from the actual practice of sin, but that we should also abstain from whatever looks like sin. First Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him and one Lord Jesus Christ, for whom are all things, and we by him. Albeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But, listen to this now, take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge, see that meet in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him that is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if sin make my brother to offend, I will not, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother. To offend. You notice that? So if it looks like sin, if it appears to be sin, abstain from it because you're going to make somebody offend. You're going to make somebody stumble. You're going to make somebody walk away from God. Romans chapter 14, verse 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. It's good for me to go and have prayer meeting at 11 midnight with a single lady. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to go with a single lady to the park and sit on the park bench. It's a good thing. But it's a good thing that could be easily spoken evil of. You know what you do? You abstain from it because it turns out to be an appearance of evil. Romans chapter 14, verse 13, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Verse 14, I know, and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean by itself of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But, if thy brother be grieved by thy meat, now workest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good, that's what we read earlier, be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. 
Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another. For me, destroy not the work of God, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with conscience, with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth uh, not himself in that which he alloweth. Look at verse 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Listen, people, a man will never begin to be good till he begins to decline those occasions that can make him look bad. Can I repeat that? I thought of this yesterday and I just shook my head because it's so true and it's so deep. A man will never begin to be good till he begins to decline those occasions that can make him look bad. I have, I have to repeat that the third time. A man will never begin to be good till he begins to decline those occasions that make him look bad. Let's read more scriptures. Psalm 26 verse 3. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. If I sit with them, people look at me. It's an appearance of evil. They think I'm wicked like themselves. You go to a party, they put all kinds of alcohol on the table, but you are just drinking your soda, your Fanta, your Sprite, or whatever you are drinking that is non-alcoholic. What, what do you want? All look has to say as they take the picture of you people sitting around with bottles of wine and bottles of alcohol. Abstain from all appearances of evil. Psalm 26 verse 4, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Let's go to Genesis. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. You notice that? I'll talk more about that at the end of this summer. In verse 11, and it came to pass about that time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. He says he will not be with this lady. Will not be with the lady. So what she did was uh, trap him by coming in while he was walking. And you know the rest of the story. Abstain from all appearance of evil. I want you to notice closely what this exhortation says. It does not just say abstain from evil, but to abstain from the very appearance of evil. So if something even appears or borders on evil, get away from it. If there is any chance whatsoever that it could be wrong, then, my friend, leave it alone. If there is even a suggestion right, that it could be wrong, then flee from it. A believer must have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with evil, not even the appearance of evil. Romans 12, 9 tells us, let love be without dissimulation, that is, without hypocrisy. 
Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. First Peter chapter 3, verse 11 tells us, let him eschew, that is, turn away from evil, shun evil, and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Job 28, 28, and unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Depart from evil, Psalm 34 tells us in verse 14, and do good, seek peace, and pursue it. Psalm 97 verse 10, ye that love the Lord, hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Proverbs 4.27, turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Don't hang around evil. Could be an appearance of evil. Proverbs 14, 16 says, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but a fool raceth and is confident. So don't go with confidence and say, Well, I don't care. It may look like an appearance of evil, but I'm not doing evil. You're going to stumble and fall, but you're going to make somebody stumble and fall also. So Paul is admonishing us today. Appearance of evil, abstain from it. How do I fulfill that advice? How do I fulfill that counsel? Very simple. You must shun and shy away from the very shows and shadows of sin. The word which is ordinarily rendered appearance signifies scenes that can be described as kind of, sort of. And so the meaning of the apostle seems to be this. Abstain from all sort of types of sin. Abstain from all kinds of types of sin. So what is sort of or kind of abstain from it. Whatever may be interpreted as evil by others, so as to become a stumbling block or a matter of reproach, abstain from it. What may be an occasion of evil to ourselves? Some things not evil may actually lead to evil. Did you hear that? Some things that are not evil may eventually lead to evil. Can I repeat that? <laughs> Some things that are not evil may eventually lead to evil. So why don't why don't you just get away from it? Why don't why are you hanging around it? Right now it's not evil, but it may lead to evil. I think the story of Peter is a classic one in John chapter 18. Let me read it to you. In verse 15, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus unto the place of the high priest. Verse 18, verse 16. But Peter stood at the door without, and went out that, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then said the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Thou not also one of these disciples? And he said, I'm not. And the servants and officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Look at verse 25. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, I, are you not one of his disciples? And he denied again. He said, I'm, I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about. And then in verse 26, one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did not I see you in the garden with him? Then Peter denied again, and immediately the cock crew. 
Peter going into the palace of the high priest to warm himself was absolutely innocent. But it led to something really tragic. It led to his denial of Christ because so many things took place. What about Achan? Achan looking at the money and the garments could have meant nothing at all. But it led to something disastrous for Achan. He stored up covetousness in him. Joshua chapter 7. Look at what it says in verse 21. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. And I took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. The same thing with David. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 11, 1, it came to pass. After the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an even time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba? the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the high tide. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him. And he lay with her, for she was purified from uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. The woman conceived and sent unto David and said, I am with child. You know the rest of the story. Now David walking upon his roof top, and by chance, seeing a naked woman taking a shower could be considered innocent. All right? If not for what followed. So there are some things that lead to some things, some things lead to some things. And I like what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 37. Turn away thine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. That's how to handle whatsoever is close to evil or approaches evil. Turn away, turn away. You know why God gave us eyelids? He gave them to us for a purpose. You know why God made our necks while it is not, why it is not stiff? You can turn it to the right, you can turn it to the left. It's for a purpose. You can close your eyes and turn that neck away from evil. And you can definitely pick up those feet of yours and run away with them. Should location demand it. I like what the writer of the book of James said in chapter 1 in verse 13. He says, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Two deadly words are in that verse 14. The first is, drawn or drawn away. The second is enticed. Once we succumb to those two, it's a downward journey from that point. Well, what are the advantages of abstaining from appearance of evil? That's a good question that is worth considering. What are the advantages of abstaining from appearance of evil? Well, Paul said, abstain from all appearances of evil. What do I get? What do I gain? 
from obeying that. Number one, many of our falls will be prevented. Did you hear that? Many of our falls will be prevented if we abstain from what looks like evil. Check it out in the scripture. Samson. Samson knew he didn't abstain from appearance of evil. And you know what happened to him. Not only did he fall, he also died. Number two, another advantage of abstaining from appearance of evil, it will give credit to our profession and tend to convince the world of the reality of our religion. I repeat, when you abstain from appearance of evil, will make people go like this. Wow, this person is a real Christian. And those who are not convinced in the world about the reality of being a Christian, they will be convinced that there are Christians out there. That's an advantage of abstaining from evil. And that means, contrary to that, if we don't abstain from that which is evil, we'll be like what the prophet said to David, that the enemies of God will be given opportunity to speak against God and against the ways of God. But there's a third advantage, and that is that it will contribute much to the peace and satisfaction of our minds. Yeah. When you abstain from all appearances of evil, you yourself will have peace and you'll be satisfied. Your, your heart will not condemn you. Your spirit will not condemn you. I like what Spurgeon once wrote. He was actually quoting another author. He said, a man that will keep out of the cold in winter shutteth all his doors and windows, yet the wind creeps in though he doth not leave an open hole for the wind. You know, that's so true. Winter is just uh, wrapping up here. And during the cold weather, I had to go and fix my front door around December because the draft was coming in and it was making the whole house to be so cold. You know what Spurgeon Father said? We must leave no inlet for sin. We must stop and block every hole and cranny by which sin can enter. There is need of great care in doing this. For when our very best is done still, sin will try to force its way in. During the bitter cold, like I just said, we close the doors. Sometimes we even put sandbags that look like snake behind the door and on the windows. We draw the drapes and the curtains and we arrange the screens. And yet, with all our efforts, we are made to feel that we live in a northern climate. In the same way, people, we must be diligent to shut sin out. And we shall find abundant need to guard every point that the draft can come in. We shall be happy when we shut out the world. We must follow all measures which common prudence teaches us in earthly matters. We must drive out the coal by keeping up the fire. You know, that's what you do. I have a, a boiler in my house in the basement and you've got to keep the fire in. The fire has been on for months in that boiler. And the thermostat, I got one, two, three thermostats in my house. You turn it up and the fire warms up the house. The same thing, people. The fire must 
burn within us. The fire must burn within us. That's the only way we'll keep the cold out of our hearts. The presence of Jesus Christ in the soul can be so warm that it warms the heart and worldliness and sin will be expelled. Then we shall be holy. Then we shall be happy. May the Lord grant us that. May the Lord make us people that are totally surrendered and totally sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me close with some important thoughts that I can glean from what I've said to you so far. The first is this. Appearances are of high importance. But some people don't see anything wrong in that. They say, I have not done any evil. It just appears to be sin or sinful. And by the way, that's your own opinion, you say, they say to you. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't see what is wrong in what I've done. Appearances are important. If they were not important, Paul the Apostle will not have said, abstain from the appearance of evil. It's not evil, but it appears like evil. Abstain from it. But there's a second thought here is that appearances and not what a man means determine his influence as a member of the Church of Christ. Appearance, not what you mean. I don't mean it that way, but it appears that way. I don't mean to portray that, but it portrays that. But that's not what I had in mind. But that's what you are sowing in our mind. So appearances and not what a man means determine his influence as a member of the Church of Christ. Very important. But there's another thought here as we close, and that is this. To give heed to that which cannot be approved when tested by the Scriptures the sole way of apostolic teaching is to submit to influences that must ultimately lower the tone of spiritual life and affect us for evil in our conduct. So it's very simple. This thing that I'm allowing in my life, can it pass the test of scriptures really? When you actually look at it and put it on one side of the scale and put the scripture on the other side of the scale, will it really pass? If it's not going to pass, it's not going to pass. That's why I don't understand those who are Christians who are acting plays or movies and they give them roles to play where they have to smoke cigarette, where they have to drink. And they say, no, no, I didn't drink. I just took the cup and I just put it in my mouth. It was just a play, it was just a movie. Uh, you put a cigarette in your mouth, but you don't, you just uh, pull it in, but you don't inhale. It's an appearance of evil. If it's gonna give people a wrong impression and it's gonna contradict the Bible, then don't do it. If you're not going to eat it, why do you smell it? That's what my mother used to tell us. When she puts food on the table and then you take it and, and you're smelling it, my mother hates it. If you're not going to eat it, why are you smelling it? Come on, take your nose from that thing. And I think that's what God is saying to us today about appearance of evil. Take your nose from it. Take your mouth from it. Take your body from it. Take your presence from it. But there's another closing thought here, and that is that the qualities which may enable us to avoid the appearance of evil should be sedulously cultivated. Accurate judgment, tender conscience, 
and perfect self-knowledge. Those three will help you to abstain from appearance of evil. Accurate judgment. You know how somebody says, this is bad judgment. You use bad judgment, my friend. Tender conscience. If your conscience is tender and is not seared with a hot iron, there are some things you will not do. But if your conscience is seared with a hot iron, you'll do anything. You'll say anything. It won't matter to you. And then you know yourself. You know yourself. So why are you getting close to what you know you don't have the strength to overcome? Let me repeat that. The qualities which will enable us to avoid the appearance of evil should be seriously cultivated in our lives. Accurate judgment, tender conscience, perfect self-knowledge. Let me move on to number five, the scriptures which portray so minutely the appearances of evil should be diligently studied. I always tell people who have weakness in one area or another and come to me for counseling. What I do is to gather scriptures for them that, I, that contradict what they did. And I tell them to go and memorize them. I tell them to go and use them in prayer. And it's always worked. So if you're going to be able to abstain from all appearance of evil, you've got to be able to also find scriptures that portray so minutely the appearances of evil. Study them diligently. Memorize them diligently. Use them as prayer point diligently. It will break the yoke of your life, my friends. Number six, that the lives of those that shun the appearances of evil should be studied and emulated. Yeah. Go and read Bible history and read those who shun the appearance of evil and who said, no, I cannot. No, I will not. No, I must not. Study their lives and follow them. Daniel, here is food offered to idols. Said, I will not. Said, I must not. He said, no one can make me do it. Follow their example. Follow the example of Adam Clark, who used to work in a garment store where they stretched the garment. If anyone came into the store and wanted to buy, they stretched the garment and then put it on the table and measured it in the presence of the person buying it. And they say, you see the length? And they say, yeah, it's correct length. And then you buy it. By the time you get home, it has shrunk. And they say, the material you bought is not long enough. And you cannot take it back to the store because they measured it in your presence. But they didn't tell you that in the back room, they stretched it. And Adam Clark, that holiness preacher, looked at them and they said, you know what? The garment may stretch, but my conscience cannot stretch. I love that. Don't let anything stretch your conscience. Keep it pure, keep it clean, and keep it righteous. You know, I read something the other day about Billy Graham. And I don't know what to think of Billy Graham. I think he was one of the most successful evangelical preachers that ever lived. He has gone to his reward now. And he was scandal free all through his time here on earth, at least to the best of my knowledge. Maybe you are wondering, why was this guy so scandal-free? Maybe, maybe, I said maybe, just maybe. Maybe it is what is called the Billy Graham rule. Yeah, Billy Graham had a rule. What is the Billy Graham rule, you ask? Billy Graham rule is a code of conduct that many male evangelical leaders have embraced. And you know what it is? This is the personal principle by which Billy Graham lived. And many, 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 many men who are in the preaching ministry have embraced it. Billy Graham will never spend time alone with a woman to whom 
he's not married. Never. Or maybe I should say he, to whom he was not married because he's with the Lord now. But that was his policy. I will never spend time alone with a woman with whom I'm not married. And now many men have adopted this as a display of integrity, as a means of avoiding sexual temptation and to avoid any appearance of doing something that is considered morally objectionable, as well as for avoiding accusation of sexual harassment or assault. Don't you just wish that David had that kind of policy? Don't you just wish that Samson had that kind of policy? It would have saved them from the mess that they got themselves into. Number seven, make sure that your goal should be to always sincerely answer this question in whatever you do. Before you do it, answer the question. Will this be a good report or will this be a bad report? If this comes out to the knowledge of people, will he speak well of me or will he speak bad of me? That was what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. I repeat, whatever things are of good report. I say one more time, whatever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Good report is not just what you think, it's also what you do. So before you get involved in it, ask yourself, will this bring good report or bad report? If it's not going to be of good report, please don't do it. That was a policy of Joseph that I read to you earlier in Genesis 39 verse 10. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Some people you need to avoid completely and not be with them. They invite you for dinner, don't be with them. They invite you for prayer meeting, don't be with them. They invite you for a walk, don't be with them. They invite you for tea, don't be with them. He refused to be with her. He refused completely. I'm not going to be with you. That sounds like the Billy Graham principle, does it not? The only way she did what she did was because she forced herself on him in the conduct of his duties. Not because he was drinking afternoon tea with him, I mean with her. Well, people abstain from all appearance of evil. It's a very clear, unmistakable commandment of God, which many have heeded and they have been blessed. And many have violated and they have regretted. I'm sure you don't want any regret in your Christian walk. I pray that as you heed these things, you will be a shining example of who a Christian is supposed to be. May God help you. And I pray for myself also that may God help me so that we will not just be hearers or me being the preacher of this, but I will be doers of this thing also. Please abstain. Please avoid all appearances of evil. It's a clear commandment that you will never, ever regret obeying. Let me pray for you as you go off the air. Father, I'm not only praying for them, I'm praying for myself also, that you help us all to listen to and to obey this admonition of Paul the Apostle, abstaining, running away, fleeing from anything that appears to be evil. Where we have failed you, we pray that you forgive us. Help us to start afresh and start anew today and live a life with a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. 
Thank you, Father, for the new grace you've poured out upon us right now. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we'll be back again next week by the grace of God. Until then, please abstain from all appearances of evil. Bye-bye.